This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self-Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Neil Spruce, welcome to the Self-Help Antidote. Well, thank you, Bobby, for inviting me. I am honored to be here. So a lot of my listeners don't know this, but you are one of perhaps three people that are responsible for me spending my entire career, or most of my career for that matter, in the health and fitness business. And I just want to briefly talk about another person that led me to that decision, uh, Mitchell Pacifico. So I got my first real quote unquote job in the fitness industry at Gold's Gym in Brooklyn, Staten Island, Fort Lee, New Jersey. And one of the things that struck Mitchell this curious is everyone who came out of Apex, a company that you founded, they seem to have this zealous tenacity about the organization, what they were doing. And he was like, these guys are completely full on and sold out. Bobby, I want you to go to one of these schools. Back then, it was five days, 10 hours a day. I know you remember those. Yeah, for sure. Trust me. And he was yeah. like, just, just, I want, what are they teaching in this school? And I went in and spent five days in class. And when I came back into the facility, I was wearing full on Apex kit and gear and T-shirts. I remember Mitchell looked at me. He was like, they got you too, Bob. And for me, it wasn't the education because I had been going to a lot of educational courses and they were all rewarding. But I felt for the first time in my life that I walked into an atmosphere of complete and total belief and direction and purpose. What was it for you working with nutrition analysis in the Gold's Gym days, working as a bodybuilder, as a fitness professional? What was that point where you said, okay, there's something that I need to do and Apex is the vehicle through which I need to do it? I mean, well, you know, for sports and fitness, and you know, my, my story, it saved my life. You know, I grew up an outlaw and uh, I would have gone very deep if it wasn't for football first and then bodybuilding. So I, I made that decision. I kind of flipped the switch. I was going to pay that forward. I was just very good at it. And whenever I did, you know, I studied hard and without nutrition, you know, you, you don't exist without a, as a bodybuilder. Exercise is totally secondary to nutrition. So I really fell in love with that. So I looked at it in a different way of what I wanted to, the way I wanted to instill nutrition beliefs. I realized there was, you know, nutrition is one of those things that there's so much quackery involved because it preys on people's weaknesses of wanting to look a certain way, be a certain way, this diet, that diet. And that drove me out of my mind. So the first thing I always did when I started teaching in any of these schools was create, we would, would deliver the problem. And then this is how he created the solution. And the, the people could see the passion in me. First of all, when you lead by example, like, like we did and all the people that worked for me in the very beginning, you find people that have the same self-interest, same values in life, and you lead by example. And then people just, you're not selling anything. You're just telling them and you just assume the sale. The next thing you know, you've built a culture of people that are very like-minded because they really believe you because you believe you. And it's happened to you. And that really is the part about, you know, being a, whether you're a lecturer, you can be a monotone lecturer, you can be an excited lecturer, you can be one of those guys that yells in a room, you can be a guy that has inflection in their voice, you can be whatever it is. You know, but people are pretty smart overall. And they eventually can smell a rat, they can tell, you know, there's something really good in this person's soul. And I want to be a part of that goodness. And I think that's what resonated with people, certainly with me. And I didn't do it on purpose or anything. It just kind of worked that way. And we built, you said it, we built zealots. And, and you're one of them, Bobby, that became one of the best, you're one of the best lecturers I've ever heard. And uh, I've you. always been proud of the people that have come through our, our schools, our teaching schools that we had, because it was, it was very cultural and culture, by the way, culture trumps strategy all day long when it comes to running a business, you get the right people in there. So that's pretty much, I think what it was, it was just that that transfer of enthusiasm that was just automatic. And next thing you know, wham, you're in it. Well, there's a couple of things that I'm hearing there. And one of the things that I'm hearing is common 
the other, it's not so common where you said that you, you were having an experience where exercise, nutrition, bodybuilding, it saved your life. And you hear that a lot. Like I was on a bad path in life or some people like I was on no path in life. I didn't have clear cut direction. And for me, I found this and everything changed. But what you don't hear as often coming from the same place that it's coming from is authenticity. People believe you when you believe you. And everyone's admonishing you to be authentic in delivering your message. What's your definition of authenticity? It's leading by example, number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is always going to be number one. It should be in everybody's book. And if they're going to write one thing down, that's what you better write down now. If whatever you're selling, you better believe it. And then you're not selling anything. So authenticity, it just, it's something, it is, it is very spiritual. It is. It's, it's something people pick up. There's a, there is something that resonates from a person that is real versus not real. And yeah, there's plenty of con artists out there and a lot of gullible people and stuff there. That's a small, that's a smaller minority than you think. Most people are pretty sharp. They get it. They feel it. And they understand it because it is, it is, it is something real. It's something that happened to you and you're transferring that message to other people. And it's in a natural way. You're not thinking about sales. That has never happened. And you know me as well as anybody, Bobby. There's never been in my, t- my, my in time in my life where I attached a number to a message ever. You know, and, and in fact, that we're even in the health club business when it's all about numbers. You know, I was always that saving grace for people because you come into my world, it's about doing the right thing. And if you do the right thing, the numbers will come. And it was always that first, never talked about numbers, never, never put bogeys around anything. It was just all about doing the right thing and people are going to join. So that's, there's something, again, people just, they feel it coming from you that you are authentic. So when you started with Apex, you left nutrition analysis, what was the point where you said to yourself, or was there a point where you said, this is working? I know that we're doing what I intended to do out in the fitness industry. Was was there a specific turning point? Well, it, it happened with nutrition analysis. That was I, I started that for Gold's Gym Enterprise. Gold's Gym, I was just fortunate that Gold's picked me up when I was a bodybuilder, and they gave me that platform to blow up nutrition, and I did. We blew it up in all their gyms. They became the top gym chain in the world. Very fortunate uh, that I had that platform to be able to do my nutrition lecturing. If I didn't have that, I'd be stuck in San Francisco still just talking to people. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. So I had this incredible platform that just started in the eighties, you know, as far as franchising out into, into the real world and so forth. So that was really what got it happen. And I, I realized I just hit a home run. I mean, my first gym that we installed, I mean, everybody's going really nutrition in a gym with personal training. That's unheard of. Isn't a gym <laughs> just to exercise. Isn't that all you do when you, you come here? It's an exercise house and the trainers teach you how to exercise. <clears throat> what happens the other 23 hours of the day? Right. That's how exercise is only a trigger event for what you want to happen. It sets the stage, but nutrition makes the movie. Bad nutrition, bad movie. So I realized that we had everything we needed there. And that's when I knew it was working because every gym signed up for it. I couldn't even I couldn't even get to a gym fast enough to do a grand opening installed in nutrition. So I knew it then. And the only reason that I ever left goals, there's only only reason uh, was because I had to save the world. I couldn't just save the goals gym brand. So I, you know, it broke out and started Apex. So I could, but now I went globally beyond the brand. That's all. So in, still all my best friends. In retrospect, is there anything that you would have done differently? You know, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a common question that I get. And the answer is no, probably not. I don't think I could have done anything differently. Certainly not there. You know, not, certainly not in the time. But you're saying if I think back, uh, is there something I could have done? Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess I've never really thought deep enough to it because I, I really, this is, no one's ever done. And again, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. So please excuse any me, me, me stuff here, but no one's ever done what I did. I mean, it never crossed anybody's mind to put a nutrition program, especially on software into a gym. Ode Hogan was my partner in that whole thing. You know, we were together forever doing that. He would write the software. I would write the logic, you know? <laughs> so it was pretty cool. That little relationship we had. Imagine this in the mid eighties, way before the internet, right? So this was all on, you know, a PC and gyms didn't even have computers. So we had to do all that. So, you know, I just, I think we, we were way ahead of our time. No question about that. Doing anything different. 
you know, I, I really don't know if you could have, because we're just, we're, we were literally walking blind, you know, into an industry that didn't understand anything about technology. You know, that, that's an interesting statement because we were walking into an industry that didn't know anything about technology. And you fast forward decades later, we're immersed in technology <laughs> exactly. and it's changing like every other day. So somebody who's getting started yesterday, obviously they're getting started in a very different world that, than we existed in way back in you know, the 80s and 90s. What would be a key piece of advice to give to someone who's just starting their career, not based on all the things that have changed, but on what, in your opinion, never changes. Yeah. So I have some some pretty simple rules around those things um, for someone just starting out in business that wants to be, let's say, it doesn't mean that you want to be an entrepreneur or you have that spirit in, but you want to be the best you can be, right? Mm -hmm. And you want a long lasting career in whatever you chose. Well, first of all, you know, the first number one thing you got to do is you got to, you really have to choose the right product. So in other words, it has to be something that pretty much everybody needs and wants. And, you know, obviously we pick fitness and that's something that everybody certainly needs and most people would want. But guess what? It's commoditized, just like technology is commoditized, like computers are. Everybody needs a computer. Everybody needs a cell phone, but there's just everywhere. So what do you do different? So this person that you're talking about coming out, what is your unique selling position about your product? Whatever your product is, maybe it's training people, right? Maybe it's just exercise. Maybe it's a kinetic chain assessment. But whatever there it is about fitness, if that's what you're choosing, for instance, we're using fitness as an example, it could be something completely different. Like Apple nailed it, obviously, with computers. And they can sell things for three times more than they're worth just because it's Apple. So they nailed it. So you've got to focus on your unique selling position. I was very fortunate. I chose nutrition inside fitness so and the first to do it. So it was a lot easier for me. No one had ever done that. So auto- automatically you're king. And you kind of just stayed focused there. But the second thing is, you know, you really have to, you have to have a passion for what you're doing or you're just not going to work hard at it. Passion, you know, breeds hard work and hard work is contagious. So the people around you will help you succeed. They want to be like you. So leading by, you know, leading, you know, leading by example is is part of that whole thing as well. But that passion, I mean, people are afraid not to work because you work so hard at what you're doing. And if you're not going to do it, obviously, if you're, uh, you know, if you are, it's a, something you don't really care for. You're just trying to make a, make a buck, a quick buck or something. That's that part. And then the, the third thing is commit to finish something. Eliminate the distractions in your life. Do everything you can and stay focused on your vision, your mission that you created for your one year, your one year um, to-do list into a five year. Where do you want to be in one year business-wise? And where do you want to be in one year uh, career-wise and one year uh, personal-wise, five year uh, personal and all that. And try to stick to it, eliminate the distractions, lose all the downers in your life the you know the people that are that, br- that bring you down or any else just you know push them aside enough to completely ignore them but you know just don't let them into your into your main orbit and that's so that's that part of you know committing to finish finish gets dealt in without distraction and then finally you know and it gets it gets past that you know you've got to be patient i'll tell you right now bobby my number one problem i have with executives in my businesses or anything coming up is they get impatient they're, they're, they're looking for any place where grass is greener. They want to make a certain amount of money in a certain amount of time or something, which happens often. And they end up thinking the grass is greener over there. And as you know, in my life, almost everybody's always come back. I always go, hey, maybe it is. Go. Go check it out. Most of them have always, always want to come back. And I always let them back, of course, because you, you're not going to know unless you do it on your own. But that's the one thing is patience. You know, in our in our world, we deserve to be very highly paid. Unfortunately, many trainers aren't. You know, they, they, they don't just change people's lives, they save them. So, but they, unfortunately, if, if the things that you want in life become more important than what you do to get them, you'll probably compromise something. And that's the last part of my rules. And that's integrity. And that's the fifth one. If you don't have integrity, you've got nothing. And integrity is making a decision every day when you get up in the morning. It is every day when you get up, it's choosing the truth over popularity. Stay evidence-based, stay the thing, but do it your way. Do it your way so it's different and unique. And that's what I would tell anybody that was starting out. Try to be the best they could be. There is so much to unpack there. I want to talk a little bit about the truth. You talked about evidence-based. What is the truth? 
because everybody thinks like, you know, what they're doing is the truth. What's the difference between my personal truth and the truth? Well, okay, that gets a little bit, again, as we know, we've seen it happen from political <laughs> in politics today. Obviously, there are people with a whole bunch of different truths than other people's truths. Exactly. But let's, let's try to cut away from that. In the fitness industry, it's not that hard to know what truth is versus a fad. Uh, that doesn't mean that a fad can't change the truth because science changes every day. The more we learn, it does. But evidence base is something in, in, in science that we, which means that the strongest contingency of experts agree with that modality. That's what they agree mm -hmm. with today. That changes as time goes on. It didn't change. I always tell people, if I'm saying the same thing I, that you heard me say five years ago that I'm saying today, I wouldn't listen to me again. I'm just stuck in my own little world and I can't get out of it. I'm not looking at all the new research. I listen to professors that are, the last time they opened a book was, you know, 1980, you know, and I said, I go, really? I mean, I haven't heard somebody say that in a long time in the real science, you know? So there's, there's definitely a place in, in where the world we live in fitness and, and nutrition, where it's pretty easy to stay evidence-based, but you also, you have to meet people where they are and you have to be able to be there before they get to the next space, right? And that those are big, big things for people that want to stay in business to understand. So with nutrition, you know, it's always been that I'm not going to tell you what to eat. I'm just going to tell you basically how much you can eat based on how much you move or how much you do this, you know, because, you know, everybody's going to have a different reason there. And then I'm going to fill your gaps for you. So, I mean, those are the kind of things you can do to give leeway into certain people because you can, it's, you'd, be hard, you'd be surprised how hard it is to talk someone out of a fad diet that is really a bad diet. And anybody that has half a brain of nutrition knows it, but you just can't undo them from it. So what you gotta do is work with it. Hey, here's the stuff you can do to help offset that, you know, and, and go there. So, you know, the truth is really, in science, it's easy. Uh, when it comes to politics, it's not. So I think what I'm hearing there is you have to understand to some degree how to interpret research. What does the data show? You know, has this been duplicated? You know, is this a one-off study or has this been duplicated a couple of times? You know, what's the quality of the journal that was published in? What's the impact factor there? If you're not doing your research, you might be led astray by quote unquote fats, but there's an intersection of empirical evidence and understanding a little bit about the psychology and the human being that you're guiding, meeting people where they need to be met. I love that. And I like what you said, before they get there, because you yeah. start to see certain patterns when you work with people. Okay, psychologically, this is what a lot of people are predisposed to. I can almost kind of predict this pitfall. I'm tempted to ask, and to really, this is just a purely cheeky question. You said horrible diets. For example, yeah, I, I, you know, it always, always cracks me up. You know, I think it's certain things that are out there. But if you look at like, you know, a keto diet or a paleo diet, they may ha have their place because it's something easy for someone to follow, right? But they're listed pretty much at the bottom of diets when it comes to healthy diets. They eliminate entire food groups. So it's good for my business because I got to buy supplements like crazy to fill their gaps. <laughs> so that's all good. But it's not good if they don't meet me. Or they don't meet us, you know, and then we find out, you know, if they're going to stay in the diet. Most people don't stay in those diets very long, so it's no big deal. And by the way, I don't want to knock the paleo diet so much because there's like 17 versions of it. And some of the versions are a hell of a lot better than the way the typical American eats. I mean, almost any diet's better than the way the typical American eats. That's why I was doing. Well, I had such great luck on this particular diet, you know, like an all like a grapefruit diet or something. Well, I'd hate to see what you were eating before then. You know, so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot to that fact of where were you before when you started that diet? So that's, that's kind of it. You know, just, those are, again, always tough conversations with people. That's a fair point. You know, when, when I'm listening to your advice for somebody who is getting started in the industry, I'm thinking, what is the common denominator? Like, what's the thread to all the piece of advice that you're giving through integrity, through patience? And you got to think about what causes people to deviate from that. We, we've all had like the local coffee shop because it's not just fitness, is it? And they open up and the coffee is great and the service is spectacular and you love going there. You love supporting them. In a relatively short time, they start watering down the coffee. They start losing business because they're impatient. And it's like, okay, 
we know this, we all see those cycles, yet people jump into those cycles of impatience, even though they could probably, if they weren't emotionally attached to their business, they could probably look from the outside and predict what the outcome of that is going to be. And for me, it's passion. And passion is not necessarily, I used to think passion was, what am I really excited about? Now I think passion is what is so deeply meaningful to me. I'm willing to suffer and sacrifice for it. I'm willing to stay on the long journey because this is so deeply resonant with who I am and what it is that I want to do. Am I hearing that correctly? I think so. I think your question was what gets people, you know, to move or become impatient mm -hmm. or take the other side of integrity, you know, away. Well, at the end of the day, you know, if they're if they're not where they are, they're really, you know, and the, the depression is rampant. Social media is, you know, it, as good as it is for a lot of things. Like I love looking at what my friends have been doing that I went to high school with mm -hmm. or something like that, or, or I never really went to high school, but my friends that were in the same high school. I mean, it's like, you know, I love looking at them. You know, that's all great for me and many else, but you know, it's done a lot of damage you know, uh, to, you know, to people's psyche and the depression we see now in kids and so forth. So they get to a place in your life where you could be in the working world and all of a sudden you're just not feeling like you're getting anywhere or doing anything. You become impatient and you kind of look for something else and you'll cherry pick, you'll sort of manage data for your own convenience to make you feel better. You know, and that we call that in science, we call that cherry picking the study or two to support your thesis you have to, that's the only study and it's taken out of context in the first place that would even come close to supporting what you're saying and 99 other ones support the opposite side so you know you can always manage data for your convenience depending on where your head's going what bias you have in what direction so that's what happens these you people whether they go get through depression or they have a lousy boss they have a lousy work environment you know they they could get to that place where they're you know you're going to make a decision that might you know compromise you know, things that they would normally do and make it, you know, to try to get to wherever they may be. And that's, that's understandable. But catching yourself is very important because, you know, again, it really is about all of it. It is about caring. It is about integrity and figuring that out. And one thing I always tell people, and I'm not the only one that says this, but it's the people that are willing to do the little things that add up to the big things, the little things every day that add up to the big things. Those are the ones that will win in the big time. That's where patience comes in. So what if you're in a situation where like, okay, I know I'm excited about this particular aspect, but you, you talked about social media and comparisons. I see everybody in this space. How do I know what my unique selling proposition is? Because you talked about USP earlier. How does somebody discover that if it's not abundantly clear to them in the moment? Yeah. And that's a, that's a very, very good and deep question, by the way. Um, and I would say that, you know, the only thing for me was that I, I, you know, when I talked to people about nutrition, I watched them lock themselves on my eyes because I would say things that they hadn't heard before. And when I saw that, I realized that my unique, unique selling point was just myself in delivering the message. And that's, that was really it for me. And then I decided to be, okay, I'm going to be the smartest guy in nutrition. And I'm not, but I'm telling you, I work every day to be the smartest guy in nutrition, right? Without I, I, every day, you know, I'll never be the smartest guy in a room, but I'll be the hardest working guy in any room. Now, no one, no one ever doubts that. So just that one piece there. And then I just, I realized it was my sort of presence with in front of people. And I built the business, as you know, Bobby, on lecturing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, an active lecturer. I've never had a, never taken a course in speaking in my life. And you, most people could probably tell listening to me. But guess what? <laughs> For some reason, they lock on to me because they can tell I never took a course in speaking. But there's something just real, real that comes out. So that was mine. And I, I discovered it over time. So, you know, it really depends on what you're doing. If you're not doing anything, I'm not sure how you're ever going to discover you know, anything more than what you're supposed to do, what your unique selling position is. But you do have to discover what is it in your personality. It is personality, 100%. Your unique selling position comes from your soul. It becomes into, you know, what, what's coming out? What is it, the passion that drives you to be, God, I'm going to go study kinetic chain assessment for like 10 years and come up with the most amazing thing in the world. And that's what I'm going to sell. 
you know, if you have a passion for it and you're willing to do that, that's one thing. But is you, then you got to deliver it and you got to sell it. So you may not have that ability. So there's it, it is something that you have to recognize and it's just going to come out. I don't know how to teach someone to do that. What I'm hearing, if I can break this down, is you've got to be connected to what people need, not just what you're passionate about. When you find a connection between what you're excited about to the point where you're talking about going, studying the kinetic chain for years and years. And we know a lot of people that did that. You know, I did that for a portion of my career. It's what are you so passionate about that it pulls you toward it? What's the intersection of that passion and need? And get out there and experiment, do stuff and pay attention to the response you get. Because very often, if, if you're listening, people will tell you what your USP is. Correct. Yeah. Then you, 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 you nailed it, Bobby. Yes, they will. They'll tell you and you'll recognize it. And another one of our cohorts, you know, a guy that you and I love, I hired him, uh, uh, Lenny Parasino. He's a classic example of a guy that discovered his unique selling position. This guy can move a room mm -hmm. and he can get all yeah. eyes, you know, the average person what? Here's about 10%. I think when Lenny does a lecture, I think they get 90% of what he says, you know, and he's just so good and so successful at it. Another one of our great you know, cohorts in our, in our world, you know, that started back in the, back in the Staten Island, Connecticut days, yep. you know, everything else. So I'm just saying, again, he found this unique selling position. It was his ability to express, express deep science into something understandable and tangible for people that don't want the deep science. And he was, he's able to do that. Lenny had a particular impact on me as well. And I think the two of you are very similar in that there was so much conviction. Lenny could take complex sciences and, you know, half the things that he was saying, I wasn't even sure I could pronounce them in a spelling bee. I'd be absolutely crushed, not to mention completely comprehend at the moment what he was saying, but he had a way of structuring it in the delivery that if you yeah. understand the structure you felt confident that I could go back and learn this and start to plug it into the intellectual framework that Lenny gave to me. But it, it was more than that. It was, this isn't just information. This is essential building blocks for something that you have to deliver. Because if you don't deliver this, if you don't walk out of here and do this today, and I felt like this, you are letting people suffer because they're not getting this and they desperately need this. And if you do this, you will be right. Not intellectually, but ethically. You'll do more than, in your words, Neil, make a living. You'll make a difference. Yeah. And I remember those exact words and walking out of there almost like infected with this compulsion to solve a problem, this compulsion to help someone. I think that makes the difference when you're drowning in a sea of information and you have endless Instagram accounts that you're comparing yourself to. It, it's that conviction and you did it live. And I, I think one thing that we've seen over the past couple of years is live is not going away. You know, getting face to face with somebody in an environment where you could viscerally express not only what you've learned, but who you are, that's power. Great. Yeah, well said all the way around. What are you most excited about over the next 12 to 24 months? The fitness industry has been turned upside down and shaken. What, well, what excites you? Well, for me, you know, and again, uh, my time has come. You know, uh, needless to say, you know, people now are, uh, you know me, Bobby, I've been saying and telling everybody, hey, listen, self-health care is the future. Health care, the, 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 what we have today, Bobby, is what we call sick care or disease care. We don't have health care. It's after the fact. Well, now, since, and, and sadly, it took COVID to make this accelerate faster. I've been teaching self-health care. Uh, in other words, trainers with a holistic solution that can tell you what you should be eating, filling your gaps and moving properly. That's healthcare. We're taking care of your health while you have it. Huh, that's healthcare. I'm caring for your health while you have it. Doctors, and again, I, I don't throw doctors under a bus. They're doing their job. You know, they're fixing people when they're broken, but they don't have to be broken in the first place. At least 90% of the stuff that happens to people is preventable. And that's what we do. So protection, be, pre prevention before cure is the world we live in. 
And that's the way I want everything said. And that's the most exciting. COVID has accelerated my dream for the world, accelerated by 10 or 15 years. In our gyms today, Bobby, we have traffic back in most of them. You know, I'm in almost 2,000 gyms. You know, we're owners, operators, and pro uh, uh, big, big giant chains and so forth as well. Our, many of our gyms might be up to maybe 90 or 100% capacity, but most of them are anywhere from 50 to 70 capacity. But guess what? Nutrition sales in those gyms are up anywhere from 30 to 100% to 1,000% in some because people are now asking for it. They realize what, what just happened, the, the, their, their distrust in big pharma, uh, because obviously they, they not only started the opioid, you know, uh, crisis, the, the, the writing of pills and prescriptions that wipe out our kidneys and stuff. That we could have protected you from getting those things in most of the population if you've been with us in the first place. So they have a distrust in big pharma, the new awareness of self-health care, the new awareness of the hazards of, you know, pre-existing conditions has now made everybody look at nutrition. They go, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, they were right. They were right. So now when they come in, they're listening to us. And we're, you know, saving them tons of money on the other side and good things are happening. So that's what I'm most excited about. I think in my lifetime, I've always worried, as you know, I'll be 70 next month. And so I've always wow. worried about, about, my gen about me being able to save the world before I die, you know, with, with, with fitness. In other words, make that dent, make the pendulum that's gone too far here with disease care, bring it back to true health care, the preventative side, which is you and me and all the people that you know, have worked together to give somebody a holistic solution. We're not going to do it as exercise instructors. That's ridiculous. We're only going to do it if we give them the whole enchilada mm -hmm. right there. Here's what you need for you and your family. Let's just stay here and let's keep you up. Let's keep you moving. That's all. Nothing fancy. Keep you moving. That'll keep you with a healthy weight because we're going to make sure that your nutrition fills all the gaps that you're going to have from whatever diet you're eating to make sure with those little three things there, we got a good shot at keeping you out of there. You're still going to get your physicals and all your preventative stuff on you know, your mammograms and all that. But I can promise you one thing. You won't be going there for about 90% of the stuff you didn't need to go there for. I mean, it's interesting. I think healthcare is now over $3 trillion we spend on healthcare in yep. this country now. Yep. Over a decade, I was in front of an audience. I was talking about the fact that we spend $280 billion on healthcare costs and 80% of those, just like it is today, uh, are lifestyle related. They're behavioral in nature. And I remember thinking, what an absurdly high number. I mean, and we have so far eclipsed that in over a decade, but I, I believe you're right. I've seen this, not just in the gyms, but out and about with people, there seems to be an awareness. And I like to say conscientiousness because I think you know, even 10 years ago, people knew, all right, should I go with the, the greens and the salad or Ben and Jerry's? What's the better choice? There was kind of an awareness there, but there wasn't the same level of conscientiousness. I don't know whether, you know, COVID probably did accelerate it, but it's starting to emerge. In what ways in five years, based on these trends, would you say that this industry is going to look different? You said you can't do it. You know, you can't do it as an instructor alone, what are some of the changes we can expect to see? Well, you're saying five years, and I don't know. I, I, it's hard to put a timeline on it. I just know what's happened to our properties. Mm -hmm. People are now focused on holistic, uh, not just a place to work out. They're, they want the rest of the information. That's where I would love to see the gym business go, because there's not a single person in the world you know, that shouldn't get some type of life coach, some kind of coach that can give them that information. And we happen to have a, a physical resource where you can actually work out in too, if you want, you know, so that's always the perfect place to be able to handle that. So rather than going to your doctor's office every other week for a shot or dialysis or something, long before that would have to happen, come into our place, you know, and just do that for almost no money. I mean, that's nothing, right, at the end of the day. So I think that's, that's where I'd love to see it go. But, you know, I, I don't know how long, because, you know, this could be another thing that fades. If you look at you know, right now, you look at the numbers and it's bad news that we're actually getting fatter. Now, a lot of that had to do with COVID and the lockdown and everything else, but we're getting fatter. Disease rates are up higher. You know, all of these things, uh, you know, healthier people, healthy people are getting healthier and fatter people or people unhealthy are getting worse. So there's a there's a strange sort of dynamic there. It really has to start early and get people to recognize that. 
and, and how easy it really is. It's so simple to be able to prevent stuff from happening. It's so easy. But unfortunately, it's just it's, it's difficult for people to just change that mindset. So hopefully that gets out. But in our industry, what's happened already, Bob, the bad news is about we're down with con, uh, the contrition now so far on gyms. We've lost 20 percent of brick and mortar. They'll probably uh, never come back. They're gone mm-hmm. for good. Gone for good. And many of the small boxes are gone for good. There'll be virtual training a little bit here, but I do think an exercise overall will start to pick up, you know, and we were, we doubled down, you know, my partners, because they're you know, very, very huge equity groups. They doubled down and bought all the gym, met and all the gyms, many of the gyms in our territories that were, went out of business and went bankrupt. So we got them for 10 cents on the dollar and we're able to bring them in and then and we put our solu- a solution in there. So I like to think of us as healthcare and hopefully the gym business starts going in that direction. That first line, I, I think the people in the white coats are the trainers in the gyms that have those holistic solutions. Those are really the first line of defense. And I think that's really what we're, hopefully it gets to that point, you know, because bottom line is there's, gonna, there's definitely less gyms right now, but hopefully the intellectual property in the gym becomes more complete. There's a lot of people that are listening to this now that don't work in health and fitness at all. I mean, they're fitness enthusiasts, but it's not what they do for their profession. There's so many reasons why we eat the way we do, why we live the way we do. And the complexity of those reasons is wide and it goes pretty deep. But if I'm sitting here, I'm listening to this right now. I'm going, I, I want to make a change. I just struggle with making those changes what advice would you give someone in terms of a first step that you've seen work pretty well for the general population? That's the easiest question anybody will ever ask me because that's the one that I get quite often. And it's nothing more, it's nothing more than a trigger event. You need to find something. You need to have a reason to do it. You look at people that have lost and gained weight, Bobby, they've lost gained weight like six, seven times. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden they actually lose the weight and they'll think it was the diet they went on. I went on this diet. I finally lost it. And I go, no, no. you just lost it because you had a reason to. It's all one word, motivation. You have to find something that motivates you. And once you do, whether it be, God, I got I want to reduce my insulin uh, injections. I want to do th- I want this. I want to be able to see my kids to get to college. And it doesn't look like I'm on 10 medications already. And I'm only 60 years old. And I'm not going to be able to do that if I don't do something. Or you have, a, a, by the way, sadly enough, a life-threatening event isn't enough. It's not the top trigger event for people to get healthy. The top trigger event for people to get healthy, you know what it is? I think you do. It's divorce. 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 Ah, That's the yes. top trigger. Around. Okay. The most high, the most successful weight maintainers went through some sort of disruption in their spousal relationship. And it's almost always divorce. And number one, and triple bypasses are way down the list around number five or six. That won't even get people eating right. And the big problem we have there are the choices that people have out there in, in food. I mean, no one wants to eat you know, skinless chicken and broccoli every day. You know, so the, and the choices get wide and, and, and the more that you try to restrict yourself, the more you want the other stuff, you know, so it gets very difficult that if you're motivated, you will do it. You look at bodybuilders. I mean, I competed for 20 years and it's miserable dieting for a show, but we lost every inch of body fat or you can't compete every single bit, starving to death, working out six hours a day and starving yourself to get in there and everything else. Why? We're motivated. You can't win. You can't win. You can't even get on stage unless you do it, you know? So, but of course, as soon as it's done, we just gain a lot of, a lot of, not tons back. We're never in bad shape in the off season. We get a little bit of body fat back and then we just do it again the next time, but it's all motivation. That's what it's going to come down. So that's what I would tell all your listeners, get motivated, find out what is it going to te- get you and, and make sure you get support around you to stay motivated on that. I want to touch on that. Because one of the things that I appreciated about you as a presenter, as well as Tom Purvis, um, that's a name from the past, was the affinity for semantics. Before we have a conversation, you were really good at this. And so was Tom. What exactly are we talking about here? What do you mean by that? Now, from that common foundation, let's talk. And you, you're talking about motivation. And one of the things that I've heard on this show a couple of times, motivation's overrated. What you really need is commitment. 
And that's always perplexed me because I'm like, wait, hold on. What's your definition of motivation? Because my definition of motivation is not an elevated state of emotion. It's not excitement. It's a reason for doing something or behaving in some way. So without a reason for doing something, why would you ever do anything? That doesn't make sense. And what I also hear you saying, it's not logical. It's got to be deeply visceral and connected to values. So quick story. I have someone who is very important to me. And this happened many, many years ago. I was working for you when this actually happened. I was with NASM. And I got a call from a friend of mine. And he said that, you know, he, he, he was, he was a heavy smoker and he went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you have, you're in phase one, stage one of emphysema. If you keep smoking, you're going to die. And I was like, wow, well, I'm not going to mention his name. I said, well, what'd you do when you got out of the doctor's office? Like, what was the first thought that went through your head? He said, I was so stressed out. I, I just lit a cigarette. Sure, I yeah. needed one. I said, well, you heard the doctor say you're basically going to die. And your first thought was, I need a cigarette. And he's like, Bob, I just, it's, it's just what I did. I said, wow. So you're, you're still smoking. He said, no, I quit. I said, so hearing, hearing that you're going to die from this wasn't enough. What did it? So I went home and I told my wife, I said, I just, I've got really bad news. Sit down. And I I shared with her what the doctor told me. And she sat there staring at me. She didn't say a word. She stormed upstairs. Now, I thought, oh, she's so upset. She's beside herself. He lived in one of these houses with a spiral staircase. So his suitcase came flying over the top, down onto the ground floor. And then all of his clothes. Then she runs downstairs and she says, listen, I need you to leave. I'm going to tell the kids, like, you, you just left because we've been asking you for years, like to stop smoking. How am I going to raise these kids by myself? You selfish son of a bitch. Get out. He was like, that was it. That was it for me. Death didn't move me, but the thought of losing my wife and my family, that was more than I could bear. Yeah. Never lit a cigarette again. Yeah. And that's what the difference, you, I mean, you, you asked the question about commitment versus motivation. I mean, commitment could be because someone, you know, held a gun to your head or you had to do it, but you had to be motivated to do something first before you're going to commit to it. There's got to be something inside your soul that has to get done that you're motivated to do. And then you can commit to whatever it takes to get that done and lay it out. One more question. Sure. As you look back over your career, that's impact. I mean, your career has impacted me enormously and countless other people. What are you personally most proud of? Well, you know, um, for me, I think it's being able to put this fitness empire with my partners together. Obviously, I wasn't responsible for all of it. I'm just lucky to have the partners from the, my goals gym days to the Mark Masteroff days. You know, these are just very special, special humans and platforms that believed in what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And so I, I would see, you know, I, I certainly I want, you know, the two things in my, my legacy that I've worked for forever was to do find people like you, Bobby. My, my whole existence was to find people like you to help give others the tools they need to live better lives. And that's the legacy I've worked for. And the more I can do that by getting partners you know, like the Mark Mastros that believed in what we what I was doing and letting me have that distribution throughout the world with his properties and everything else. And then, of course, with Golds in the earlier days and then with NESM, as I was fortunate enough to own that. And with them now today being huge, you know, owned by Blackstone. So I really have, you know, that's that's my goal. And that's been my legacy, you know, so far. And I wanted to make sure it stays that way till two things, finding people, giving them the tools to actually make people they touch live better longer number one so therefore when i walk away from this earth that people will say he helped make the next generation better than him and it's not just about my family it's about all families and that's the way i want to end it yeah and and just again 
uncommon because you hear about the monomaniac on a mission and hustle and grind and all of that's important. But what I'm hearing here is you're only as good as your team that helps you spread your message to a far greater number of people. It's got to live beyond you and it's got to involve a cause that's greater than you. Yep. Neil, thank you so much for your time today. This was, uh, Bobby, this was great. Yeah, anytime. Hey, your family, buddy. And your, uh, you know, your listeners, hopefully they got, they got to glean something from this. And uh, just, I've always been a big fan of you and, and your lectures and everything else. And you're getting it done, brother. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.